Thank you so much, Chris. You could have forgotten the 39 years, but other than that, <laughs> um, it's, a, it's really um, a pleasure to um, be here um, introducing uh, one of the individuals who took an early vision for the potential of AI and helped to make it the transformational force it has become in healthcare. Paul Ritchie, as Chris pointed out, um, just stepped down as chairman and CEO of Nuance Communications. What he achieved in his 18 years at the helm is nothing short of remarkable. Building on a corporate history traced to some of the most storied players in the tech industry, SRI, Ray Kurzweil, Xerox, Paul took Nuance from an imaging software publisher with $50 million in annual revenues to a multi-billion dollar technology innovator with a broad product suite centered on its conversational AI solutions. Under Paul's vibrant leadership, Nuance brought AI technologies to telecommunications, to the automotive industry, and to financial services. And where, of course, would all of us be without the tender voice of Siri? And for purposes of this conference, of course, an enormous impact on healthcare. Paul's exacting vision was that artificial intelligence would be able to integrate seamlessly into workflows so that it boosts productivity and enhances decision making. I'm eager to hear, and I know we all are, his perspectives on what he sees as the next stages of the AI revolution that he has helped lead over the past several years. As Jim pointed out, or rather as Chris pointed out, <laughs> Dr. Jim Brink, radiologist in chief at Mass General and the Juan M. Taveras Professor of Radiology at Harvard Medical School will interview Paul. Since rejoining MGH in 2013, and why did you ever leave, Jim? <laughs> Jim originally trained as an engineer and has come back to MGH, and he's made AI, strategic collaboration, and data management among his signature priorities. So let's give both Jim and Paul a hand. Thank you, Kathy, for that very kind uh, introduction, and thank you, Paul, for taking the time to be with us uh, here today and uh, these past uh, these few days. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. This is quite, a, quite an honor. Thank you. Um, you've had a tremendous career, as Kathy pointed out, uh, nearly 20 years of leading this amazing company uh, with innovations in so many different spaces, um, as she highlighted in uh, automotive, uh, the Siri app, and so forth. And I guess, you know, we're all talking about what AI means to us in terms of how it can transform so many industries and even our, uh, touch our personal lives. How do you see AI and really how has um, Nuance really participated and, and really led this, this change? Well, um, actually, as Kathy said, we, we had a vision 20 years ago um, that if people could interact naturally with computers, it would empower them as consumers, it would empower them as, uh, as workers in, in the workforce, um, and then it would enable a class of solutions that simply didn't exist. Um, and we have pursued that vision over the last 20 years, uh, methodically, um, looking at very specific markets and very specific opportunities, knowing that it would take two decades for the technology to evolve. Um, and in particular, um, we went after the market for um, customer service, uh, which itself was specialized into very specific applications in financial services, telecommunications, uh, other verticals. And we went after the mobile market, which ultimately evolved into uh, the automotive business. We ship software on about 50 million cars a year right now. Um, and then finally, we went after the opportunity in healthcare. Um, where we believed that ultimately the paradigm of a virtual assistant would be a quite, quite a powerful um, augmentation to the clinical workflow, and we can get into that more. 
Right, and so all these, these advances in so many industries, you finally did bring it to healthcare, or you, you did at some point make that decision. And um, how did those, uh, those experiences in influence that decision or that, that experience? That was probably the single biggest investment decision we made. We made it maybe a dozen years ago now. Uh, we weren't in the healthcare business, um, but we were seeing some opportunities uh, through um, some partners that we worked with. Um, but we thought we could be far more transformative. Uh, we believed that uh, the combination of speech and perhaps even more importantly than speech, natural language processing, so that the ability to interact with workflows irrespective of the medium of communication, um, and ultimately other elements of artificial intelligence, predictive analytics, um, we believed it would allow us to build solutions in healthcare uh, that focus very much on the problem of clinician productivity. There are lots of problems in healthcare. Maybe we'll talk about some of those. But the one that we were focused on was how do we, how do we improve the productivity of the physician? And I think um, that that opportunity, while we've made real strides in doing that, that opportunity is significantly more in front of us than behind us. I think that um, as we envision what the next 10 or 15 years holds uh, in healthcare, uh, it's, I think, quite a powerful opportunity for us and for others um, as we think about um, the paradigm of in incorporating a virtual assistant deeply into um, an EMR so that we have essentially ambient intelligence um, in the clinical setting, um, taking care of the problem of documentation for the physician with almost entirely automated um, uh, enabling real-time access to information that uh, physicians need, uh, pa patient information, content, relevant content, um, uh, recommendations, analytical recommendations that might be derived by uh, AI. Making all that available in a seamless way in the clinical setting, I think, is, um, is an opportunity to address um, some of the problems that, that have been talked about in this conference around the frustrations with uh, electronic medical records. I'm sure all the practicing physicians in the room are, are appreciative of your comment about so much more to be done because certainly uh, we very much appreciate the, the efficiency gains that, uh, that uh, Nuance has brought to uh, certainly in radiology and I'm sure other domains as well. How, how, does, how do you see Nuance differing from other software uh, vendors such as Google or, or others? Well, we were early, we made an early bet on speech when it wasn't working at all. Um, and um, uh, we proved that speech could be made to work in large scale. And we proved that speech could be uh, commercially viable um, as a technology. Uh, but this pointed the way for others. And as you pointed out, Google and others have entered the, the business. Um, but uh, we have some unique focus, I think, that will continue to serve us well. First of all, we are used in, by more than half the physicians in the United States today, so we're deeply embedded into the healthcare system. And we have a lot of knowledge and a lot of focus on the workflows in healthcare in particular. Um, and I think as we look at the problems we're trying to solve over the next decade, uh, we've really moved beyond the problem of speech to the problem of natural language processing, the problems of conversational AI. Uh, by which I mean um, complex interaction with the system, the ability to retrieve relevant information that's uh, context dependent upon that interaction. So I think we've got some unique advantages in that respect. Terrific, thank you. Um, let's, let's focus a bit on just AI and medicine. Um, certainly we've seen healthcare change dramatically in the last 10 years and are sure to change even more in the next 10 years. And um, how do you see AI influencing that change going forward? Well, uh, I want to say that, and I, uh, that I think the next decade and the, the digital transformation that's going to happen in healthcare is one that we should be very optimistic about. Um, I think that the proliferation of wireless devices uh, and um, uh, the amount of data that can be collected uh, from those devices, um, the maturation of the EMR systems. We've spent a decade implementing EMRs, and, and now we've got this robust wealth of data being collected into them. And I know there's a great deal of frustration about access to that data and the administration of all that. But nonetheless, it's a real, it's real progress. Infra building infrastructure is always painful. I lived in the back bay during the big dig. 
Um, but um, uh, the um, but we've 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 built that infrastructure. In the next decade, um, I think we'll work out a lot of the problems. Um, and I think the application um, of artificial intelligence to population healthcare management is going to make a big difference. I think, as I mentioned in previous comments, we're going to materially reduce the burden on clinicians uh, associated with all this. So I think uh, as we think about the next decade in healthcare, AI is going to play an important role in all those things. There's some real obstacles to achieving them, but it's going to play an important role in that ongoing digital transformation. Great, thank you. Um, what should we be doing to prepare for this? In healthcare, are, are we well prepared? Are there things that we should be doing to uh, bolster our infrastructures or our capabilities to, uh, to enable this? I think the previous talk may have, um, the previous panel rather, um, this morning may have touched on some of these, the most critical things, but uh, uh, artificial intelligence, of course, is dependent on data. It is about the data and the analysis of data. And if you look at um, books and lectures on artificial intelligence or coursework, you'll notice that a lot of, the, a lot of what, what is talked about in, the, in, the, in those materials has to do with data preparation and data engineering. And maybe we could metaphorically upscale one level from that and think that for um, healthcare institutions, uh, thinking of preparing to how to use the data, how to get access to the data, um, I'll come back to that point in a moment. Um, I, at, a, at, a, at a system level for the institution is probably um, the single greatest priority, and there are real problems in doing that. Um, one of the speakers this morning, um, uh, Roy Beveridge from Humana, I think made an excellent point that um, population health management uh, was going to require uh, the engineering of a, a, a much greater dimensionality of data than is being is, that is being accessed today, and there's going to be uh, regulatory issues around that. There's going to be privacy issues around that, and of course, there's going to be costs and, and engineering challenges around that. Great, thank you. The um, you know interesting thing about healthcare is that we're all experts at some level because of just simply interacting with it as as consumers. All of us have either consumed healthcare or have fam friends or family who do as well, and so it gives us. Uh, both uh, industrial and professional perspectives as well as our own personal perspectives. And I guess my question is, what, what do you see as the biggest uh, challenge for medicine going forward and what will really be the biggest opportunity for AI? Well, I think the biggest challenge for healthcare going forward is that the, the American society wants to consume more healthcare than it wants to pay for. And, and that's a that's a overriding challenge. And I know there's some point of view that perhaps we're not getting the healthcare we are paying for. And maybe there's some truth to the, the, the problems of inefficiency and so forth. But we as a society want to consume a great deal of healthcare. Um, we don't necessarily want to tax ourselves or, or pay for that. And that's created enormous cost pressures on the healthcare system. Um, and um, I worry about that. I worry that those cost pressures, uh, it, has not, it has been my observation in, in, in the two decades I've been doing this, that cost pressures um, are not beneficial to innovation. Uh, some innovation is driven um, by the necessity of reducing costs, but it's very difficult in an organization to be systematically reducing costs and investing in innovation, and innovation always comes with investment. Um, and I worry about that. I, I worry that that's going to constrain organizations, um, uh, many of whom are represented in this room, from doing some of the pioneering innovation that's necessary around data uh, to exploit artificial intelligence. I think Jensen made the point in his talk about the fact that, uh, about the centrality of that data and the fact that everybody here has data. And so um, I worry about the climate in which we can invest in, uh, at the speed necessary to exploit that data because we now have the tools, we have the, the uh, computing power, we have cloud-based architectures, we've got this growth in wireless data, and it would be a shame now not to be able to exploit it at the rate and, and to seize the opportunities at the rate they're available. Thank you. Let's talk about nuance in medicine a bit more. And, um, uh, certainly, we see the delivery of care becoming much more personalized uh, with much more individualized treatments. Um, what, what do you see as the role of nuance and AI specifically in the care team of the future? Uh, well, 
as I mentioned in, our, in, in some of my opening comments, Nuance is focused on making um, uh, clinicians more productive. And in fact, we, we announced uh, in a relatively early version of the virtual assistant that I alluded to, um, I think uh, earlier this year. Uh, and um, that virtual assistant is targeted at the various members of the care team. So there's capabilities in that virtual assistant to um, address scheduling, there's capabilities to address the needs of the physician, there's capabilities to address uh, the, the data requirement, the data entry requirements of, of, of the nursing staff. I think um, software can help um, facilitate and integrate communications among the care team more quickly than would otherwise be done, and I think we have an important role to play in that. And, and, and of course, the, the, the other side of that is just the, the opportunity to bring real time inform, bring information in real time to the care team so that it can be applied at the, at the point of care. I think that's something we've made real strides on in the radiology um, uh, specialty in particular, and I think the opportunities to expand that uh, exist. Terrific, thank you. The, um, maybe at a, at, a, at a very global level, certainly uh, you and your, your team work with health professionals every day. And uh, at, a, at a macro level, what, what do you find most exciting about the future uh, in healthcare? Well, I often go to meetings about healthcare in which people are pessimistic about the, the healthcare system and, and, and frustrated. Um, but as I said earlier, I, I think the next decade is, um, is a, an opportunity for extraordinary advancement based on all the, ex the exceptional innovations that have gone on by people in this room and elsewhere. Um, I think that. Um, uh, uh, targeted personal health care is going to be extraordinary. Um, the, the exploitation of genomics in health care, I think integrating that with um, uh, the data available in patient records, as I mentioned, and wireless data is going to just create capabilities to find uh, and early anticipation of diseases, um, more, more normalized diagnosis of ailments, um, the ability to reduce errors. All that's going to happen. So I think the next decade holds a lot of promise. Not going to f solve all of the issues that, that are talked about in healthcare, but I think there'll be real progress. I think Peter Erzog made the point today that it would be difficult. I really agree with this point. It would be difficult to imagine if we projected ourselves a decade forward. It'd be difficult to imagine it won't be a better healthcare system a decade from now than it is today. Terrific. So near and dear to my heart, uh, Nuance has worked very closely with radiology to uh, develop tools that improve uh, the precision of what we do, the efficiency of what we do. Uh, it's been a tremendous partnership. Um, what, what are the lessons in that maybe Nuance has learned in working with our discipline that could help inform uh, advances uh, for the rest of medicine? Well, I think um, what I would say about AI is true generally for software, which is the more domain specificity you have, the more productive the software is at helping you. And, and so we've had the advantage over the last decade of incredible focus in the, in the radiology domain um, and um, in working in partnership um, significantly with MGH, uh, but working in partnership uh, to augment the basic workflow capabilities we had um, with uh, integrating um, decisions, clinical decision support tools that drew on evidence-based medicine, helped normalize some of the, the diagnoses that were, were, were being prescribed, um, other capabilities. And I think bringing that domain specificity, repeating that um, elsewhere in, in medicine, I think is a real opportunity. So I'm going to pause a minute and encourage people to send in questions. Uh, if you have any, I'm also going to ask for a little bit of help because somehow I've hit the wrong button on this thing and I'm not looking at where it says questions might show up. Uh, I'm looking at all the attendees somehow, so uh, maybe someone could help. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, hey, we need AI up here. I'll be a little more careful with the thing. Thank you. Um, so one, one thing that I always find fascinating about talking to business leaders uh, out, who, who manage businesses other than in medicine is what, what attributes of other businesses do you think we should embrace more in, in healthcare, maybe as uh, to help us be more receptive to what AI might bring to us, but um, or even answer on an even more global level. What, what uh, as a business leader, do you wish that healthcare did better uh, that you see being done better in other industries? Well. Um, 
every industry has some unique characteristics, and so I want to be careful about generalizing. But I would say this, that when um, I listen to conversations that have gone on over the last uh, day and a half, and I, I listen to conversations I have with leaders in the healthcare sector, there's a lot of focus on um, reducing costs, bending the cost curve, a lot of focus on uh, value-based medicine, a lot of focus on outcomes. All, the vocabulary centers around all these things. Um, but in other industries, take the automotive industry, take the mobile industry, for example, there is an obsession with, with customers um, in a very direct way. And it's very much built into the vocabulary. Um, and I think that if there were to be something truly disruptive that happened to healthcare, um, in the next decade or so, it would be because somebody figures out a way to empower and engage the patient, the customer, in a way that the healthcare system is just not doing today. I think customer empowerment, customer engagement um, in, a, in a deeper way that feels more like the experience that people uh, enjoy outside of this particular, um, outside of healthcare, I think finding a way to do that would be a really powerful would be a real, real really powerful catalyst in healthcare. Terrific. Um, so as Kathy mentioned, you know Paul uh, nominally uh, retired just a couple of weeks ago. Although I understand that just gives him a chance to catch his breath, uh, but it also I think gives us an opportunity to ask someone who's spent 20 years leading a company a little bit about some of the secret sauce that uh, enabled him to be so successful uh, with respect to uh, leadership skills, the culture he uh, he developed uh, in his company. And so if you will indulge me a few of those kind of questions, uh, I'd be eager to hear your, th your thoughts about what, what, were, what was your secret sauce to lead through ever-changing uh, political and economic climates uh, over the past uh, 20 years? Well, uh, administrations come and go. Um, uh, but um, uh, I would say that um, in the current climate, of course, the, the, the Challenges to healthcare that we we talked about a few minutes ago have been have persisted longer than this administration, and I think will 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 we'll persist beyond this administration. That's just been a constant. Um, there have of course been some challenges in the current um, climate to companies like ours that draw on multinational populations. Uh, we like other tech companies move to make sure that we. Um, that our employees, um, our foreign born employees, were able to continue to work. Um, but mostly we just said to ourselves we had to stay focused on the values we had and try to look past um, the anomalies that, were that are existing today. We, we are getting some questions in now, but I'm going to ask one more about uh, this topic before we take some of those. Um, and that is to tell us a little bit more about culture and what is the right uh, sort of petri dish, if you will, or to really enable the kind of innovation uh, to take root in a, at a company like, like Nuance? I think there are three elements to our culture that mattered a lot in, in our healthcare journey and are going to matter more as we think about the accelerating engagement of artificial intelligence. Uh, the first was um, we have a culture that supports customer success, and by customer here I mean institutional success, engaging large institutions uh, such as yours um, we're, we're staffed to do that. We have an ethos that says we're going to do whatever it takes to make the, cult, the, the customer and the institution successful, irrespective of the cost. We look past that issue. Um, and I think that's been a really important part of our evolution. We, it allowed us to engage large institutions as a much younger company, a much smaller company, that we would have struggled to have the credibility to engage otherwise. We built an early track record of sustained engagement with organizations and, and the, the ability to make them successful irrespective of the hurdles we had to jump over. And I think that was a really important um, element. And the second is we were a company founded on, a, on an innovative uh, idea. We, we, we believed we could make speech technology work. It didn't really work. Um, and so I think innovation has been an important part of our culture. We have a dedicated research team at Nuance. We've always had one. Uh, that's not always in favor, um, particularly in a public company, uh, to invest at the levels we have in research and development, which have been quite high levels. Uh, but I think that's an, been an important part of our culture and an important part of supporting the first point, because um, uh, research can yield um, incremental innovation that's very digestible by organizations, uh, and, and we've, been, we've, been, we've enjoyed the benefits of that. 
And the third is just trust. Uh, we're so intimately involved with the organizations we, um, we engage with that we've had to maintain high levels of fidelity and trust um, because once you breach that trust, you, you've, uh, you really damage your reputation. And I think the employees in Nuance really understand that um, and, and, uh, and, and live by that. Great, why don't we take a good question or two from the audience. Um, uh, the first is, um, how important will it be for academic medical centers uh, to partner with industry in order to take uh, or be able to continue to have a meaningful role in, in healthcare innovation? Any advice to both parties on how best to work together? Well, uh, our partnership with um, partners and our partnership with MGH has been a good example of that. Um, uh, I think the answer to the question is that a great deal of the innovation that's being talked about um, at this um, forum, and I should just mention the, the 19 presenters yesterday morning, that was an extraordinary, I would have come just to see that. If, if, <laughs> if, my, if, if, I, if I had just seen that, I would have been, I would have, it would have, would have been worth all the, the, the effort to come here. Um, but uh, that kind of innovation carried on, um, I, I think, is going to be centered around academic uh, institutions. And, um, and companies such as Nuance, I think, have a great opportunity to work alongside them. I think that's where some of the most important work is going to be done. Great. Uh, next question is, um, um, learning from radiology, how do you think the, quote, nuances of other areas of medicine will scale with time? Uh, is the problem harder or has it become easier? Well, um, let me say that radiology was a really good specialty to focus on because it has, um, uh, it has a very transactional uh, element to its day-to-day its -day work. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a specialty of scale. It had defined workflows, and, so there, there, and, and there's an abundance of data. So there are lots of things there that came together to, and, and I think will continue. I think the advances in radiology uh, over the over the next few years, uh, has been which have, some of which have been talked about in today, in today yes, and yesterday, I think those advances will be will, will be quite impressive as well, as we build systems that augment uh, radiologists in doing the important work they do. Uh, finding ways to apply that uh, that that same formula to other specialties is um, is proven somewhat more difficult, but I, I think it is going to happen, and part of what has to happen. Um, in institutions is to, is to do the work to make that necessary because, it, again, the more specific the solutions are, the more domain specific they are, the more powerful they're going to be. Uh, another question um, asks, can you imagine an AI that is personal to each patient, interacting with the patient daily with feedback and recommendations based on all health data and medical records? This AI could then communicate with the doctor in advance or instead of a, an in-person in appointment? Yes, the answer is yes, I can imagine that, and I think, in fact, that will exist. I'm not sure that will exist within a decade, but um, we will move along towards that point, and that, that speaks to that issue I raised a moment ago of, 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 of patient empowerment and consumer empowerment. I think that as we think out over the next 10 or 20 years, healthcare will be transformed in part by, uh, by uh, empowering the, the patient and the consumer to address some of their own healthcare problems preemptively. This, of course, is a critical issue to addressing the behavioral health problems in the country, which, which have been persistent um, and haven't shown, uh, haven't shown that they've yielded much to in, in, in early years to some of the data that is being made available. And so the possibility that we could in, in, uh, build systems that were individualized, and AI certainly can do that, um, uh, that would help engage cons uh, patients on their behavioral health patterns, I think is, is, is an area of real promise, and that's clearly going to be necessary in order to reduce the cost of healthcare over the next generation. Terrific, one, one last question I'd like to ask, uh, maybe, uh, Given your recent transition, as you look uh, to a room full of uh, some of the younger folks in the audience, uh, what advice would you give to someone uh, starting out their professional career in, in healthcare, given this technical revolution that we're, we're experiencing? Well, I'd give the advice here that I give to employees at, at Nuance uh, for quite some time. Number one, 
I would encourage um, young professionals to adopt a bold and, and, and ambitious vision um, because that's what's necessary in order to do really important things. Um, and to be animated by that, that vision and your, and your goals. There's so many distractions over the course of a career of 10 or 20 years of you starting your career that you've got you've to maintain focus on that vision, uh, I think, in order to do something important. And um, I, again, have seen some really exciting examples of that in the presentations earlier yesterday. Uh, the second thing is to invest in yourself. Careers can be depleting of intellectual capital um, unless you really make a concentrated effort to invest in yourself. And um, I would really encourage people to say early in their career um, that they just were going to do that. They were going to dedicate, and, and I have this conversation with employees at Nuance all the time, you've got to invest in yourself in order to maintain relevancy 10, 20, 30 years into your career. And the third, which I think is the most important, is to just approach the day-to-day -day problems of actually getting things done with, with um, an air of optimism. It's just been my experience working with thousands of great employees at Nuance over the years that the more optimistic people were, the more they got done. And I think um, that if you can combine that vision with investment in, and optimism, um, that you're going to reach some of your potential. Fantastic. Please join me in thanking Paul for sharing his wonderful insights. Thank you, Paul. That was really great.